Hi, I'm Art Bergeron and welcome back, uh, this time to seminar number seven of the 12 part series that I'm doing on what I'm referring to as Elder Law 101. Uh, it, for, I, I've noticed that a number of people have actually been watching the earlier ones because I've been speaking to folks. Uh, once again, to briefly recap, I've been all throughout the series focusing on my friends Frank and Mary, whom I always use as my example, my, my Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. And, and in the first seminar I talked about what these folks would have wanted to have and did have for their estate, for estate planning documents and what their concerns were then when they were under 60. Then I had a presentation specifically about elder law in your 60s as people are retiring and slowing down and thinking about Medicare and Social Security and then dealing with your 70s when people are thinking about whether they need to be, whether they can be staying in place, whether they need to adapt, whether they need to move. I talked about uh, dealing with, I talked specifically about taxes um, because it was April and then in May we talked about living life in your 80s where you're a little bit more worried about um, really getting much more frail. Um, and then uh, last month I talked about the fact that you can always qualify for mass health because when you're getting into your 70s and 80s and beyond you're always worried about uh, whether if you need nursing home care or need a lot of care at home to go to a nursing home you can qualify for uh, mass health. And as I explained last month, you almost always can, right? So, th but this month um, is um, a little bit different. We are now talking about the last year of your life. Now, we never know exactly, of course, when the last year of your life is. Your last year of your life may be happening, you know, to you right now. So, but to take my, um, for example, my folks, um, Frank and Mary, if Frank and Mary were age 75 right now, then according to uh, federal data, um, Frank's actuarial life expectancy would be about 11.4 years and Mary's would be about 12.92 years. Or another way of putting that would be uh, that for Frank, uh, he will be dead uh, at 86. That would be the last year of his life if, if, the, if, if he's typical of the actuarial tables. Uh, and Mary would be dead or be living the last year of her life when she was 87. So the point is, we all, there is going to be a last year of your life. Now, of course, you may not know it. If you're Frank, uh, you may not know that tomorrow you're going to get hit by that truck. Uh, and if you're Mary, you may not know that you're going to fall into the swimming pool tomorrow. So, you know, you may be living not just the last year of your life, uh, but the last day of your life right now. I know for myself, I am now uh, 73. Uh, and this spring, I had my third TIA. Uh, which is a strange experience because the thing about a TIA is you're actually uh, experiencing um, what it might feel like to be dying. Um, where, where literally I was coming back from a, you know, picking up something at, a, at the Home Depot and felt my arm getting numb and then my leg getting numb and so numb that I really had to sit on the floor. Uh, and then my wife came into the room, we're into our house and I said, you know, I think I'm having a stroke, but it came out, I feel like, and so we said, oh, I think it's time to go to the hospital. Um, and it, you know, as it turned out, it was a temporary uh, problem. That's why they call them TIAs, it's temporary. Um, but it was a, a, a very clear um, reminder to me of how I might die, um, because I might die from strokes. This was my third TIA. So, and it, we all hope you know, that, that, oh, we're just gonna die in bed and, and not wake up, and, and certainly, uh, that's theoretically possible. By the way, when I was talking to my doctor recently, because we were talking about the, the you know, the, w w how to deal with in the future, given the fact that we have now had these TIAs, I said, so you know when people die, you hear people died in their sleep, right? Well, you know, they don't just die from sleeping, right? I mean, they, so do most of those people die from strokes in their sleep? And, and, and that's what they really die from is a stroke. He said, that's right. He said, most people who die in their sleep uh, if they're dying suddenly in their sleep, especially, they, they're, they're dying from a stroke or because they had a heart attack while they were sleeping. I said, you have a heart attack when you're sleeping? He said, oh yeah, you know, it, 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 it wouldn't be necessarily the kind of heart attack that would wake you up, that would necessarily cause pain, it would just, your heart would just stop. Um, and of course that would then cause a stroke because then blood wouldn't be going to your, to your, to your brain and, it, and, and you'd have the stroke. But the point is, um, for, for, for that particular condition, for heart attacks and strokes, um, death can come very suddenly. 
Um, it, it can also be debilitating. You can have a stroke and you know and still live, but be really debilitated, right? But the, it's the one. Uh, I don't want to call it a disease, but it's the one cause of death that can come really suddenly. On the other hand, there's cancer, which probably isn't going to happen that suddenly. It may come, and we, you know, we've, we've, you've all know people who were doing fine, and I had a very, very good friend and, and colleague, Attorney David Gadboys, who was doing fine and, lived, and, and was living right about my age, right about, right about 73 or 74, and then just you know, had some pain in his stomach, I think, and when they went to see the doctor, and the doctor kind of opened him up, and then closed him up, and said, you know, the good news is, you know, this can't, you've got cancer, in it, but it, it's grown slowly, and so uh, you've got some more time. The bad news is it, it grew slowly, and so you didn't kind of know about it, you know, until now, when it's really too late to do anything, really, um, to try to reverse any of this. So there's cancer, there's Alzheimer's disease, um, which we're all aware. And so going back to the cancer, one of the things about cancer though is that typically for cancer, you don't end up in a nursing home. You, end, you stay at home and you have therapy and stuff, you know, and you get, maybe you get better because of the treatments or you don't, and then you die at home or you go to the hospital and then you die. Um, but you are typically very, you know, um, um, co uh, cognitively able until you die. On the other hand, there's Alzheimer's disease where you may be slowly deteriorating for a long time. Uh, I, was, I remember listening to a, um, a, uh, a seminar that was done by, a, a, it was actually a reporter from the Boston Herald who had Alzheimer's disease and he was talking about, he described it um, as, as, as pretend that your brain is an onion and every day just you wake up and one little peel is like gone and it just kind of goes for a long time. So you, and so you may be very uh, um, competent uh, and coherent as he was when he was doing this presentation. He'd been going down this path now then for a couple of years. You know, he's, he's, he, I don't believe that he has died yet. This was a few years ago. But the point is, that's a very different experience uh, from heart attack and stroke, which could be really sudden, right? Where, you know, you could die from this or you could you know, get worse, you know, and then kind of come back to do a plateau and then you kind of get, do a lower plateau and then you kind of die. Well, I know that one of the terms that doctors use for m many seniors is something called failure to thrive. Failure to thrive, what does that mean? That just means that kind of everything's breaking down. You know, this is you know, common in very old people or people who have had a lot of problems in the past and next thing you know, kind of one thing leads to another. One thing tries to go, goes down and you try to fix that and something else goes down. It's failure to thrive. Um, and, and so there are all a number of ways that you could experience that last year of your life. So, but, the, but the point of all of this is that in all of these cases, or in most of these cases, except for the stroke and the heart attack, um, there's going to be a period of frailty where you're not going to be what you are now. And people will often talk about, well, of course, I don't want to die. Nobody wants to die. Well, but it, well you, what, you, what, what it may be that you mean by that is that you don't want to be exactly how you are. And you don't want to die you, as you are now, right? There may be a point at which you, know, you feel like, well, this is, I'd rather be dead than living in this particular way. But the point is there may be this, this period of frailty. And you need to be prepared for that. You get to a certain age. Once again, I'm 73. I, I'm definitely in that age bracket, you know, you, where you need to be paying attention to a lot of this stuff. We talked about some of those preparations in some of my earlier seminars, but to talk about some of these things briefly, first of all, you, you want to know ahead of time. You can plan, not because you don't know necessarily what this course is going to be that's going to lead you to death. You know there's going to be a death, but you don't know what the course is going to be. But you would, it would probably be beneficial for you before there's an emergency, to know the players, to know who was involved in all of this, to know who the home care providers are in your area, so that if you need home care, um, either because you, you've had a particular incident, you, you know, you had cancer, you're going through chemotherapy or whatever, or you had a stroke and you were in the hospital and you gotta, before you come back, you're gonna need somebody to help you out, right? Uh, or someone to supplement the care that's being given to you by your spouse or your kids, right? Um, you want to know if, if you want to know what kinds of repairs you might need to make or changes that you might want to make in your house either now or later. Um, uh, things, things like, you know, it's things as, as simple as ramps. People always talk about ramps, uh, but, uh, you know, adapting the kitchen against this pos possibility if you end up with Alzheimer's and you need to, you need to have kind of 
um, just better control to make sure you're not falling. There are a whole number of things you can do with your home. You want to know if you just can't live at home at some point, what the assisted living facilities are like in, in the community, in, the, in your immediate area, and whether that's you, where you would go. Because you, would, you want to ask yourself if you are, if you are, be, if you are frail, uh, are you best being frail where you now live, or are you best being frail where one of your children lives? I know we have several assisted livings where I live, uh, in Marlboro and the surrounding areas. Um, as a matter of fact, as we speak, my wife is actually helping a good friend of ours who is now 102, 102, move from one assisted living um, to another because the other assisted living is going to be better at accommodating her right now because as you can imagine, <clears throat> she's pretty frail. Um, but the point is that, that, that you want to kind of know what those places are in, in the, around where you think you're going to be, right? Because you're going to be frail in a particular place, either where you are now uh, or n near your children. But the point is, and there, are, and there are institutions around there, those are the ones you want to know about. You want to know about the nursing homes that are in the area, right? I've gone to a lot of nursing homes, as you can probably imagine, right? There are some that are really terrific, and there are some that are terrible. Uh, and you, can, you often can't tell that from the outside. The most terrific nursing home that I know of, and I've said this on shows many times, is actually in Nantucket. It's called our island home. <clears throat> there are about 35 or, I think 35 or 40 beds. <clears throat> and you'd say, well, that's Nantucket, they're all rich. Well, no, actually, that's not true. Um, um, uh, Nantucket, the actual average um, income, it's pretty typical, of, like, typically like, a, like it is here in the mainland. The only different it, difference is everybody's a millionaire because their house is worth so much, right? But when it comes to the, the nursing home, it's a town-owned nursing home, and it's kind of, you know, creaky. I mean, there, we're now I'm actually on a, with, on a group of, uh, the, with that, is this, this nursing home is so good, it actually has a friends group. There's actually the friends of our island home. The nursing home is called our island home. Uh, you know, what nursing home ever has a friends group? But the point is, that it's because it's small, it, it is town owned, everybody knows everybody there. It's a, it's a, it's a it, if, if you have to be in a nursing home, that's the kind of environment that you want. On the other hand, there's some really expensive, big, super duper nursing homes that you wouldn't necessarily want to be in. Because the point is not what they look like from the outside, but kind of what the management is and how you're going to get treated. So you may want to know about those places, right? Because you just don't know during that last year of your life, there, there is going to be some combination of your living at home or your living perhaps in an assisted living and you're going to the hospital or going to rehab and, and that's where you're going to live. And at one of those places, you're going to die. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But the point is you want to know what those facilities are. And, and if you don't really want to be having to try to figure out what all those different places are like, right, then you probably want to build a team of people who can help you, right, to deal with all of these issues around frailty. Now, my, I typically say the basic team, uh, you, would, you want to definitely have your, your PCP, your primary care provider, involved in this. Uh, and if you don't have a PCP who deals with older people, you ought to be finding one really soon because this is really important. Um, you want to have an elder law attorney because you need to be kind of figuring out some pieces of all of this and make sure that you've got some documents in place um, to deal with all this. We're going to talk about that a little later. But in addition to this, and prob probably more important than in many ways than the other two, is a geriatric care manager. A person, there are a number of these folks, um, um, and you, I've probably never even heard of the term, or many of you, as, a, as, a, as opposed to, or, or as opposed to even actually knowing somebody who is a geriatric care manager. These are folks who typically former nurses, or still nurses, nurses and social workers who have decided that what they want to do for a living uh, is to focus on, on, on working with seniors and not necessarily providing the particular care to the senior, not being the nurse or being the home care person, but developing and implementing the care plan um, that, can, that can help the senior from the time typically that the senior is what I'll call well and not in need of any assistance to the time that the senior is close to the end and may need a great deal of assistance. Now, you would really profit 
from having somebody whom you know and who you trust, um, who can help you deal with that whole variety of things, who can be the, the third party that can talk to you, who can talk to your kids, who can deal with some kind, sometimes the tension that starts arising as your health, if your health slips and there may be different opinions among your children about what to do. There are, you know, and you may have a very, very functional family, but this is a very emotional time um, if you are, uh, in, in, if you're going through the last year or the last couple of years of your life, it's a really emotional time. Now take that emotional time with a bunch of normal people and then think about what happens if the family is dysfunctional, right? And there may be in your family, as a result of any number of things that may have happened, some dysfunction. And you want to have somebody who is able to help you and all of those players figure out how this is going to work. Figure out whether it is true that one of your children, maybe all of your children really want to help out, or maybe one really wants to help out and can because they're around and the others really can't. To figure out what they can all do and to figure out the interconnection between what they're doing and, and what some of these professional folks may be doing, a home care person who is there, or, an, or a visiting nurse, or, or other people. So you really want to build that team, and ideally, like with all of this planning, you want to get it done, or you want to have a sense of these people so you can call them before you need them, before you need them. Now, uh, in, in, in many places, um, the, the, uh, the uh, Aging Services Access Point, the so-called ASAP, will help you with that. Uh, in the area around where I live and where many of my clients are, um, that ASAP is, is called Springwell. It used to be called Bay Path Elder Services, but Bay Path recently merged with, with Springwell, which is a, a, a larger uh, ASAP that, wh which has communities that are closer to Boston. But Springwell is now covering this area. I do a lot of work on both islands, as many folks, many of my clients know. I do a lot of work on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Both of them are covered by uh, um, something called Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands, which is um, headquartered on the Cape, uh, but has folks on both of the islands. So many, so, and, and actually, those folks are, are in many ways geriatric care managers or have pretty much geriatric care managers on staff. That is, they're gonna be trying to help you figure out that total plan, right? But the point is, you need to know, it would be helpful for you to know a lot of those players ahead of time, right? That's the point. Um, and then, you wanna know the programs. Now, one of the reasons why you're hiring those players, like the lawyer and the geriatric care manager especially, is so that they'll know the program, so that you don't have to figure it out. But I just wanna talk about a couple that especially if you're now going through this with someone, right? If you're going through it or if you have a loved one who's going through it, you, you really want to know about. Um, one of the, the, the least um, known about benefits of Medicare is the so-called 60-day plan. You know that your Medicare covers your hospital stay and you know that if you go to a rehab then it covers the rehab, covers the nursing home stay for up to 100 days, covers a bunch of other stuff. But if you are homebound, which is defined as um, needing to stay home and really therefore not able to get medical care outside of the home by going to the hospital, or by doing outpatient things, by going to clinics and stuff, then, and if your doctor certifies that, and your doctor certifies that there is a, there is a, a plan that needs to be implemented that involves nurses and physical therapists and occupational therapists, not just um, home care folks, not just folks who are helping you put on your clothes and you know, eat and stuff, but folks who have these kinds of, uh, are, are these, um, what I'll call the professional class. And even if you need durable medical equipment, the doctor can prescribe uh, or can do, can issue a so-called 60-day order uh, to give you all of those things, payable by Medicare, Right, and it's for 60 days, but it's renewable every 60 days thereafter forever, forever. So this is a great plan to really help you if, one, if your goal is to be staying at home. Then there's hospice. What is hospice? Hospice is always thought of as being a benefit for those people who are like two days away from death. No, it is, for, it is a Medicare benefit 
that provides nursing care, provides counseling, provides a bunch of great stuff, right? For people, if your doctor determines that your current physical condition, if it continues, may lead you to die within the next six months. It's a terrific benefit, seldom used by people other than at, practically at the moment of their death, all paid for by Medicare, right? You should talk to your doctor about it. Um, it, it, it a lot of the administration of this happens through the Visiting Nurses Association, so you can talk to the VNA about it, right? Um, this could help you get through that entire period, the entire period uh, uh, leading up to your death. So you really want to you want to know what that program is about. But once again, the geriatric care managers are really going to know about all of this. Um, finally, I'm just going to mention the frail elder waiver. Um, so everybody knows that Mass Health is the way that you pay for your nursing home care, ideally, because otherwise the nursing home care is going to be paid privately because Medicare won't pay for more than 100 days of your nursing home care. Um, but Mass Health also has a program, which we often refer to as the Frail Elder Waiver, uh, designed for people who would otherwise need to be in a nursing home if it weren't for the fact that they could get adequate services at home. And so that's the point of the program. Now, there are asset limits to that program. Uh, if your income is above a particular amount, you're, you, and, and, and if you're a couple, it's only the income of the person who needs the services that is counted. But if that income is above a particular amount, which is now around $2,500, then there'll be a big, there'll be a copay. And you should also be aware that if you're interested in this program, it's going to take about four or five months for MassHealth to qualify you for this program. So if you are declining rapidly, right, or, or don't have the resources to take care of things in that intervening period, you could have a problem, right? But the bottom line is, this is the program that could provide for home care. Now, there is no cap by regulation on the amount of home care that can be provided. But typically, typically um, um, you can receive up to 40 hours a week of home care. So this isn't a program that's going to take care of you if you need 24-7. But if you have a spouse or a child living at home and they just really need people to take care of it some of the time, like when they go to work or when there are other things that they need to be doing, this may an be an ideal program for you. The, your lawyer, your elder law attorney would know th about that. The geriatric care manager could. Uh, finally, who is implementing the plan? You need to know, have somebody that you trust. Typically, it's a spouse um, if you're younger, but as you get older, more typically, it's one of your children because your spouse often is is about your age and is not doing so hot either, right? So the question is, who's gonna be taking care of those things and what do you need? You need four things, four things. A power of attorney, a healthcare proxy, uh, some HIPAA designations and a MOLS form. The power of attorney, the point of the power of attorney is to allow somebody to handle your legal and other financial affairs or, um, um, if you're incapacitated. You can name one of your kids, you can name your spouse, if you're naming, you can name more than one person jointly and severally so that any one of the, especially, this is especially true in the case of your kids, so that any one of them can handle things for you. If you have real estate, you want to make sure that that person has the ability to sign real estate documents on your behalf. Uh, if you're thinking about, especially if there's a spouse and you, you're thinking you may need to do gifting to the spouse in order that you can qualify for mass health, or you may want to do gifting to your kids so that you don't have to go through the, they don't have to go through the probate process. That gifting power has to be in the power of attorney. Healthcare proxy, once again, it could be your spouse, it could be kids. In the case of that, the healthcare proxy, you can only have one person at a time. Really, maybe one of the most important documents that you can execute is that healthcare proxy. But then, uh, in, well, sorry, and then, and then there are HIPAA designations. In addition to the proxy, in which you're naming one person at a time, you may want to, for example, name all of your kids and say they have the ability to talk to your doctors, to get your medical records, so that among, among them, the kids can all talk about your care, even though there's only one of them who is legally designated to deal with the doctor. Finally, there's the MOLST form, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. If you're in that last year of your life and you have a stroke or, and you have a heart attack and your heart stops, do you really want to have people try to resuscitate you given what your condition is? Or would you rather just die? Would you rather go to the, if you stop breathing, would you really want to have a tube stuck down your throat for the rest of your life? Or would you rather just die? Finally, if you want to die at home, you gotta, you, do you, want, you want to make sure that if you have that stroke or that heart attack or whatever, the EMT who shows up doesn't automatically bring you to the hospital 
because that's what's going to happen unless you and your doctor have executed a MOLST form and you've put it on your refrigerator so that these folks will know that you do not want to go to these institutions. If you do not want to die in a hospital or if, in a hospital, you need to make sure that they don't bring you there if you enter in a condition where you may be dying soon. Finally, you, prob there, you probably want to, not use probably, you have to have a conversation with your kids about how you want to be treated when you're at the point where you're incapable of making those decisions yourself, right? The healthcare proxy is the person who's going to be making those decisions for you, so that's the most important person to have the conversation with. But you should talk to all your kids about that, so there's not going to be a whole bunch of arguing. And then you should write down what those values are that these kids can rely on in, try, in terms of figuring out if, if there's a particular medical procedure that's being proposed or anything, what would you want? Because that's the point, not what they want, it's what you want. And you, get, you need to make sure that the person you name on that healthcare proxy is going to be imposing your will on the system, not their will on the system. Finally, this is just a little legal to-do list, if your goal is to make sure that when you die, your assets don't go through the probate process, you need to talk to your power of attorney agent about it and tell them, deal with this before I die. Deal with the car. If you've got the power of attorney, take the car, get, here's the title, take the car, go to the registry, transfer the car to yourself. Because if you don't, and I die owning that car, that car is going to cause a probate. Regarding the house, maybe you want that power, if you're going to give the house to the kids anyway, maybe you want the, the, the power of attorney at that point to sign a deed, giving, keeping you a life estate in the house, but specifying that following your death, without the house having to go through probate, it goes to the kids. Make sure that your bank accounts are held jointly with somebody so when you die, the assets simply go to your ki the kids. Regarding stuff that you want to give to a particular person, you get to this point, it's time to give it to them. It's time to give it to them because you're going to be able to hear them say thank you. So I hope that you found this useful. Uh, there is some law here, but there are a whole bunch of other things here. But the point of this is dealing with the last year of your life is really important. It's not going to be a dream. You're probably not going to die in your sleep. So you want to be ready and have your, your, the people who are working for you ready to know how you want to be treated during those times. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.